Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features X Factor number 67, cover dated June 1991. This is a striking cover by Will Spotacio, inked by Art T. Bear, featuring, of course, front and center there, Cyclops and X Factor in the background, along with the incomparable Inhumans. Something to note about this cover, a couple of things to note, is the all-white background, which actually mirrors what Jim Lee did this particular month, June 1991, the cover to Uncanny X-Men uh, 277 featuring Wolverine and uh, Professor X stabbed by Wolverine with the all-white background. So these two studio mates pulling the same trick in the same month. I think that that's interesting. One other thing to note about this cover is that Cyclops appears to be wearing black trunks, but that's not part of his uniform. So obviously somebody in a Marvel editorial or in the production office decided that uh, whatever way Portacio and Tiber rendered uh, Cyclops's crotch, it needed to be blacked out for uh, sale to the public. Uh, a little bit amusing that. So let's open this one up to the first page here and uh, we pick up from the end of the previous issue when ship exploded and it seemed like X-Factor had been killed but of course they've survived but how did it happen? So we get it in the narrative captions, excellent prose from Chris Claremont here who's scripting over a plot by Jim Lee and Portacio. The blast lit up the night sky bright as the morning sun all across the northern hemisphere Many who saw it couldn't help but wonder if this was the end of the world. In point of fact, they'd have been right had not the cause of the explosion, the, who, the huge sentient ship that served the mutant heroes X-Factor as home and headquarters and as their friend, boosted free of Earth's atmosphere to a distance of well over 100,000 miles in the last few seconds before the end. But while ship was able to stop to save its adopted world, there was no such chance with those trapped aboard, or so it seemed. And this is what happened. So Chip contacted Jean telepathically, and, um, and or was it telepathically, or is it just via his uh, normal computer uh, voice uh, setup, um, one or the other, because he was contact contacting her telepathically in the previous issue. In any case, um, he, uh, ship says to her, even though I possess only the most rudimentary scanners, I sense another's presence, a spacecraft gene, and it's quite nearby. So who or what could this be? Turn the page, great double page spread here. And uh, a tractor system is engaged and brings ship's life, sh life uh, boat unit uh, into that larger ship. And it turns out, of course, it is a ship that's piloted by the Inhumans. So what a double page spread this is. And the title of the story is Lunar Opposition. The creative team here, Jim Lee and Wills Potashio, the plotters, Claremont words, Potashio pencils, T-Bear inks, Michael Heisler letters, and Glynis Oliver, and I'm not sure what the first name of this colorist is, Thomas, uh, credited with the colors there. So. Uh, it's Karnak here who speaks for Black Bolt. He says, greetings X-Factor, we bid you welcome in the name of Black Bolt, Lord of the Inhumans. And then we get out of Beast here a little bit of um, expositional dialogue where we get an explanation of what the latest, or of who the Inhumans are, uh, for readers unfamiliar with them, and also their current status. A community of super beings, um, he explains to Sergeant Charlotte Jones, uh, discovered ages ago by the Fantastic Four. Bob Harris picks out the original Fantastic Four issue that introduced the Inhumans before the Galactus trilogy. That's Fantastic Four number 46. They used to live in the Himalayas until they decided to decamp their great refuge to the moon. And that was Fantastic Four number 240 by John Byrne. So, uh, Beast continues his explanation. This is pretty much their royal family, left to right, Karnak. The aforementioned Black Bolt, Gorgon, plus Crystal, um, who used to be a member of the X of the um, of Fantastic Four. No mention of who Lockjaw is there. And Iceman asked the question, but where's Medusa? I thought she was the one that always did Black Bolt's talking for him. And indeed, that is the case. But look at the art on this. This is just really well done. And throughout this issue, there is, once again, absolutely no scrimping on the detail and the backgrounds from Portacio in this particular issue. Um, really excellent, excellent art. So then there's a meeting and uh, we have 
an explanation of the situation. Apocalypse has seized the Inhumans' lunar refuge uh, for the purpose of turning the Inhumans into an army of conquest. What happened to Medusa? She was among the latest captured. So she's a captive of Apocalypse. Really like this drawing of all the of X Factor and the Inhumans around this table. And there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of characterization going on here in the body language between uh, Beast and uh, Crystal over here in the background. Both of them um, involved with the Avengers, of course, in the past. And so Cyclops here, leader of X Factor, says change of pace for Apocalypse, isn't it? Building towards an all-out war. And uh, the response is, do his purposes matter? Regardless, he must be stopped. He's already suborned some among our royal family into a cadre of shock troops, christened the Riders of the Storm. So those are the Dark Riders, and this is interesting. Uh, Jean says, we know Gorgon, we've already faced them, they kidnapped my... And that's an interesting little bit of characterization from Claremont in the dialogue there. So we've got Jean... Uh, having feelings towards Nathan Christopher in terms maternal maternal feelings towards Nathan, uh, Nathan Christopher coming out in the dialogue there just about to slip and call she was just about to slip and call him her son forgive me Cyclops's son one of them Synapse tried his best to fry my brain and that was in the previous issue and Crystal runs out and uh, it looks like uh, Cyclops is asking, how did you know their name, Jean? Your mention just now was the first I've heard of it. And Crystal runs off. She looked pretty upset. And that's because she too encountered Synapse, a brutalization made all the worse by the fact that he was a favored cousin. And now she fears for the fate of her sister Medusa. Such is the way of apocalypse to hurt you through those you care for most. And of course, that's what he's doing with Nathan Christopher, so far as we know to this point. But that is interesting because it reveals that some of the Dark Riders are, in fact, in humans. Not all of them are mutants. Um, so that is intriguing. And then we have a scene shift, and it is Ascani, and we're getting uh, the memory of her time travel trip to the present day. So the beginning of a file. Uh, sidereal scan times, sidelink, positive arc, top of the tower, abyss behind, worse ahead. Great dialogue there from our writing, our script from Chris Claremont. Interesting use of geotone here with um, some kind of white media cut into it or splashed across it as well. Um, interesting rendering of this futuristic city, the design there by Portacio. It truly does look like it is 3,000 years in the future. Um, and we have this bit of dialogue between Ascani and this other character here, whose name is Boak. And there is a discussion about her plan, which is to uh, go into the past. She says, it's my plan. Please trust me to do it right. And Boak says to her, it's a one-way ticket. So this is a mission from which you won't be able to return. And... And so he says to her, if I succeed, this entire node will be overturned. Everything up for grabs, no foretelling of how you'll come out or even if. But failure, brothers, see what that means. Look out the window, dead either path. Rather have it make a difference, make things better. So this is to counter uh, Apocalypse's tyranny in their time uh, present in the future our future and then here we go this is interesting what emerges from her time travel trip to the past and its very nature so she says too much distortion in the time stream at this end due to apocalypse at the other for light knows what reason can't send bodies anymore that's why it came down to me precedent in the family for time flying discorporate at departure transit in, transit in a state of pure energy trusting technology to hold my being coherent along the way. So this is revisiting um, the time travel affected by Rachel Summers when she came from the dystopian future of 2013 to the present, uh, way back in um, Uncanny X-Men, was it 180 something? And uh, so the mention there of the family as well, precedent in the family for time flying, implies that Ascani is a distant, distant 
a descendant of Scott Summers and Jean Grey, which is really intriguing. And of course, she's got the red hair to be a descendant of Jean Grey. So, um, and then her arrival, just look at that image from Portacio, interesting angle, that uh, three quarter profile upshot on her face, all of this discorporate energy coming out of her uh, body as well. Reintegrate on arrival, sounds so neat, so simple, so easy, just like death and resurrection, only I'm not as lucky as some who went before me. I don't end up alive in any organic sense. I'm energy, still, cast for convenience in the shape of the woman I was, held together pretty much by force of will. So that's intriguing regarding Ascani. And then on the moon, we're back with um, X Factor and the Inhumans, and they're figuring out what to do about taking back the lunar refuge of the Inhumans from Apocalypse. So Black Bolt is insisting on, well, here we go. So Cyclops says, um, surely you have forces sufficient to mount an effective assault. And Gorgon says, speaking for Black Bolt, Black Bolt insists on circumspection. But then there is um, an emergency moment. There is a, uh, it looks like a psychic flash hits Jean there, or is it, is that crystal? Um, and the Riders of the Storm have arrived. So here they are, they've teleported in and they grab Crystal. Foxback grabs Crystal there. Gauntlet here knocks out Iceman. And uh, Foxbat says, uh, don't do the Icebox too much harm. Our master wants X-Factor whole and hearty for the main event when he kills them himself. And then they teleport away. So another Inhuman snatched. And Gorgon says here, Apocalypse means to goad us into a direct attack. And what Cyclops' answer to it all? He says, in that case, Gorgon, what are we waiting for? I say, let's give the man exactly what he wants. So we're going to get action from Cyclops. And remember, of course, his son, Nathan Christopher, has been kidnapped since the previous issue. So it's time for action um, from the father for the son. Interesting use of color there in the background behind Portachio's uh, jagged edge panel. Uh, the greens there, I like it. This is a nicely laid out page. And then... We do get a scene with Apocalypse. and We've got Nathan Christopher there hooked up to some kind of machine. And what does Apocalypse have to say? He says, I am anathema to every fiber of both his being and character. That's Nathan Christopher. He may not yet possess the words with which to label such feelings, but he knows full well I am his enemy. His obliteration guarantees my ultimate preeminence, as does his survival, quite possibly my ultimate undoing. Which is why, though I would much prefer suborning him to my cause, I deem it best to put an end to the brat. What more fitting manner than by absorbing his life essence into my own? So that's what all this machinery is for. And then one of his flunkies tells him a large force of inhumans has massed outside the fortress. They appear to be marshalling for an attack. So Apocalypse is not much moved, he says, is that so? And how, pray tell, can that be when we supposedly have their entire population under lock and key? So he's thinking about that interesting use of screen tone here for uh, the shadows um, cast by this particular figure and also the room that they're in as well. Nice and interesting downshot on Apocalypse there. Um, so Portacio uh, varying the camera angles um, in the, on that particular page. And now we get some great anchor images and action shots here. This is fantastic. Look at the energy and dynamism in this particular image as the Inhumans launch missiles against um, Apocalypse and his troops. So Cyclops here says, okay, troops, let's move it. And a little bit of a comic moment there between Charlotte, who's riding atop uh, Lockjaw, and Ship has a point to make as well. He says, I delight in the, I empathize with Charlotte Jones, or Sergeant Jones's excitement and apprehension beast. I delight in the opportunity through these holographic manifestations to strike back at my tormentor, yet the despair that he will somehow see through my deceptions. So this is all a holographic um, deception cast and wrought by Ship, while the real X Factor in humans hide in the background. So, Beast says, each second we buy here, ship, gives the others a better chance of success. I only hope when it's my and Gorgon and Karnak's turn, we do half so well. So, and here's the foe. 
And what we have is, B says, five separate apocalypses. So how many can I see? Well, I see one, two, and I'm not sure about any of the rest. So Claremont adding in um, context that we can't see 100% in the image. And it's almost as if there's five apocalypses to counter the five members of X Factor. But that is a nice image otherwise. Portacio excelling at drawing these monstrous looking creatures um, who we have to assume are um, inhumans turned by apocalypse. Now this particular page is interesting because this is not inked by Art Tiber. I'm not sure who the inker of this page is. I'm not convinced that it is Portacio himself. Um, perhaps it was some um, uh, junior assistant in the Maj Studios that inked it. Um, and it speaks to maybe a little bit of a rush to beat the deadline for the printers. But the storytelling is quite decent on this page, uh, given that there is um, uh, that the deception of the uh, holograms that we're seeing here and they're fading away. And then we see the true characters here in the background. So that becomes plain in the, Im plain in the image. Karnak uses his power to find any kind of flaw, pressure points, and with the exact amount of force necessary for a combined effort to uncover the crevasse that cuts beneath Apocalypse's onrushing horde. And so they all fall into uh, a crevasse. So it looks like X Factor and the Inhumans are doing well to this point. And then around back, so they have attacked uh, the uh, another uh, team of X Factor and the Inhumans have attacked the rear of Apocalypse's uh, troops and uh, stronghold. And here they are cutting loose. We've got uh, Cyclops, of course, cutting loose with his optic blasts. Archangel up there with his uh, wings, loosing flechettes from the wings. That's pretty cool. Um, Charlotte Jones with a big gun. And uh, Black Bolt unleashing a tiny whisper, but it's basically, uh, its, its impact is uh, that of a bomb. And in less time than it takes to tell, it looks like X-Factor and the Inhumans have got the upper hand. So they're delighted and uh, they exclaim, long live Black Bolt, death to Apocalypse. Let's continue and see whether their celebrations are premature or not. So Cyclops says to Apocalypse, as we agreed, not Apocalypse, Black Bolt, he says, as we agreed, you and your people handled the army and the Riders of the Storm. I wish you the best and hope you and yours don't come through this hurt any more than you already are. For Archangel's sake, look after Sergeant Jones. Where we're going, she can't follow, no matter how much she may want to, because we're going after Apocalypse himself. So that's a great page there. Um, lovely art from Protasio and T-Bear, and the coloring complements it well. And that is a fantastic little image there. It's like what you might get on a trading card if you flipped it to the horizontal. Um, nice stuff from um, Portacio and T-Bear. And this is interesting too, because what we have here is a consistent scene of Beast and Jean Grey, but uh, Portacio has divided it into two panels, and the same down here with Iceman and Archangel. We can see Archangel's wings carrying over here, but he's decided to turn it into two panels with those jagged ed edges, which is his device for indicating action. And uh, we have various thoughts from the characters. So Claremont has chosen not to have them thought, talking while um, engaged in this fight, but rather thinking to themselves. And so we get uh, very char we get uh, thoughts from them that are uh, indicative of their character and past history. So in the case of Beast, he thinks, um, "I wonder if any of the others recognise where we are. I thought the terrain outside looked familiar." but it wasn't until we came into this catacomb uh, labyrinth that I was sure. And where is it that they are? So Jean recognizes it. These are the tunnels where I fled at the last when the Shi'ar Imperial Guard fought the X-Men for my life. And I knew if I survived, I'd once more become Dark Phoenix. It can't be real. That wasn't me. Yet the memory's mine and true. I feel that with every fiber of my being. This is where I died. And of course the reference is to the classic Uncanny X-Men 137. So Iceman picks up on the bizarre vibes from the others on the team, from Beast and from Jean. Can't say I blame them. Blue area of the moon is a hard enough reality to take on its own. I mean, an oasis of earthly atmosphere and environment 
on a world where every place else is a hard vacuum. Pretty weird, man, without all the team history that goes along with it. The others who are actually here, Gene especially, the memory must be hitting them pretty hard because, of course, Iceman wasn't there um, in Uncanny X-Men 137. And we have some personal thoughts from Archangel regarding his wings and the transformation into um, Apocalypse's uh, death. My wings know how to maneuver in these confined spaces. They're guiding me unerringly, like they knew this place. Maybe it's no accident to find Apocalypse here. Dear Lord, was it one of his weapons that destroyed Dark Phoenix? Is he hoping now for a shot at Jean herself? Interesting. What Claremont works into those thought balloons uh, going beyond the artwork by Portacio and perhaps Portacio and Lee's plot because he's so familiar with these characters and he's able to uh, give them that depth of history in his script. So, um, Cyclops and the rest deal with the facsimiles of Apocalypse and his troops because they're a pale imitation of their maker. And this Citadel, the New Mutants could have, could have done a better job defending it. He says, this is all coming way too easy. So Cyclops not fooled by how uh, smoothly things are going to this point and Gene says I'm receiving a scan link from ship his sensors have pinpointed Nathan Christopher in the chamber beyond this door just like that says Cyclops with ship's capabilities reduced to such a state he couldn't even scan the inhuman spacecraft a little too convenient I think but also an invitation we can't refuse but I won't even need my full power to break it down and that's a really nice uh, panel there of Cyclops. Typical uh, Wills Portacio anatomy from this period, the elongated neck, uh, but it looks good. So let's continue. Here we go. So we finally get Cyclops facing off against the true Apocalypse and Nathan Christopher, almost uh, completely covered by this machine by which Apocalypse means to absorb his life essence. And we have these other figures here. I assume that this is uh, Medusa maybe um, in this stasis pod as well and the implication is he's maybe drawing out her life essence as well so Apocalypse says to Cyclops give X-Factor's leader a cigar your deductive fa uh, fa uh, facilities Cyclops would do your mentor Charles Xavier proud not facilities faculty sorry I misread that bestow on your pater your most winning smile little lad a last fond memory to carry with him to his grave. So Claremont does really rich uh, dialogue for Apocalypse, really enjoying playing with uh, the vocabulary, the diction and the syntax there, um, um, almost scripting his dialogue like he's some kind of Shakespearean type villain. So Cyclops responds, you may have us right where you think he wants us Apocalypse, but I guarantee you're the one who's going to regret, regret it. And then he lets rip with presumably a full optic blast but it wasn't the true apocalypse after all it was yet another hologram and apocalypse laughs at cyclops there so let's see what happens next here is the true apocalypse and look how large he's grown from absorbing the life essence of nathan christopher and the other inhumans as well medusa crystal the ones who won't turn to his side and he says as the saying goes What's good for the goose? You've had your fun, X-Factor. Your final fleeting moment of glory. Now it's time for you all to die. And so, coming up next, the conclusion. So this has been a pretty exciting um, four-part storyline. Lots of action, lots of great artwork, tremendous scripting from Claremont, and also taking advantage of his knowledge of the characters and including that depth of history um, in their dialogue and even their thought balloons. And then we get this additional piece at the end, a little um, um, additional mini chapter that is a prologue to the upcoming um, Uncanny X-Men 281. And it concerns Sebastian Shaw and his son Shinobi. So Sebastian Shaw has lost control of his company and he's wondering who's responsible. And it was his son and so let's continue with this there is by the way i have this feeling that this little mini chapter at the end is not inked by art t or not entirely inked by him there's something about 
uh, the line work on on this page in particular that makes me wonder whether Potashi was inking himself on this. So Shaw is aghast at his son's betrayal of him. How could you do this to me? He says, you've taken the lifeblood from my very veins. Do you have any idea what you've done? My companies were not solely a means of capital gain. They were the legitimate front I employed in my worldwide covert mutant operations, but more, I was born to dirt and I struggled to gold. That's great from Claremont. So, you know, never misses an opportunity to add in a little detail in the dialogue that gives you a sense of the history of a character like Sebastian Shaw, rags to riches, dirt to gold. And so he continues in his rage. All my life I've sought a position of power and stature and you've taken that from me, you presumptuous, arrogant upstart. And there we get the name of the upstarts, this new group that is Portacio and Jim Lee's idea. Um, I would sooner see you dead than lose all I've worked towards. So I've noticed, says the son, and here we go, turn the page, and now we get a turnaround. So the son reaches in and he says he's, he, he's got mutant powers too. He can control his molecular density. Yeah, can do all kinds of things with it. He reaches into his father's chest, peek into the girl's shower room, take a crowbar to the chin, induce massive coronary seizures. So Shaw is having a heart attack there and his son is unsympathetic. He says, geez, that must hurt. Speaking of which, do you think that since my powers are so much more like my uncle Leyland's, that you're not my real daddy? And that's interesting too. So is it serious or is he just goading the man, crowing over him as he um, dies from the heart attack? Shaw says, I'll kill you for this. Shinobi says, I rather doubt that. And then the whole, uh, the whole structure that Shaw was in, let's go back to the start here, where is it? Outside of Interlach in Switzerland, um, it's a private mountain chalet, the whole thing explodes. But who emerges unscathed except for Shinobi Shaw, telling his dad he's fired, ironically. And that's the origin of the upstarts, or our first look at the upstarts and their competition. And Shinobi Shaw getting points for killing his father, uh, the Black King of the Hellfire Club. And here on the Laos page, lots of praise for Portacio um, on uh, the artwork of uh, previous issues of X Factor, but also a little um, advertisement of Peter David coming on board for either issue 70 or 71 um, as new writer of the series after its relaunch. And then um, in the coming up next, Cyclops is confronted with a soul shattering decision that will change his life forever. No lie, you must read X Factor 68 B here. And that indeed is true. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary of X Factor number 67. Let me know what you think of this issue in the comments to the video below. And if you enjoyed my review, please like the video on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.